Well, as always, it's just a great privilege uh, to bring you the Word of God this morning. What a privilege for me and um, a delight. And I want to spend our time meditating on one of the great attributes of God, uh, His faithfulness. You know, we have that wonderful attributes class, and this is just one. But I want to focus on His faithfulness this morning. Specifically, we want uh, to reflect on the need, essentially, very simple, to cling to His faithfulness to fulfill the promises He has made to us, even in the midst of the most difficult and darkest times of our lives. We want to cling to His promises. So, before we begin, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, it is wonderful to be together this morning. It's a privilege to be able to get into the Word of God, to see your beauty and majesty and glory set on display as we reflect upon your the great attribute of your faithfulness today, I pray you would encourage our hearts. The saints throughout time have, they have clung to your promises, no matter how difficult the circumstances, and they have honored you with their faith by doing so. May we be such people. May we show the world that in spite of our circumstances, we are people of faith in you, our great, wonderful God. And so I pray that you would bless this time. I pray that you would superintend over what is said. I pray that you would encourage the hearts of your people. And for those who have walked in the door who know nothing about your faithfulness, I pray that they would run into the arms of the only one who can deliver them, who has made great promises to repentant sinners through the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be faithful to fulfill every one of them. So, Lord, thanks for this time. May you bless it for the glory of Christ, I ask. Amen. Um, our text this morning uh, is one that I'm sure is familiar to many of you from the book of Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 20 through 24, of course, written by Jeremiah, and we're going to talk about the context of these uh, verses in a little bit. He said, surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses never Cease, indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Well, before we look at this wonderful text, I think it's important to set the historical context in which it was given so that we can get the weight of the importance of what Jeremiah is saying. Throughout Israel's history, almost from the very beginning, they showed themselves to be a stubborn and stiff-necked people, didn't they? Following the incident of the golden calf, God states very simply, the Lord spoke further to me saying... I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stubborn people. And Jeremiah had a lifetime, a lifetime of experience dealing with the stubborn heart of an unrepentant people who would not listen to God's word through the prophet. He states in Jeremiah 7, 23 through 27, and God is using him to speak. But this is what I command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And you will be my people, and you will walk in all the way which I commanded you, that it may be well with you. Yet 
They did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and in the stubbornness of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. You shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you, and you shall call them, but they will not answer you. Can you imagine that kind of ministry? Unbelievable. This people that Jeremiah is ministering to, it says that they forsook God. They forsook the living God. It says in Jeremiah 2, be appalled, God says, at, O heavens, at this. Shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And these are the people to whom God sent Jeremiah to minister his whole life and proclaim God's truth to them. An amazing situation for this man of God to have to do this kind of ministry. And just for a second, and not only did he proclaim God's word, he knew God's word, and he knew the consequences coming for this people as they ignored their God. He knew what was coming, and then he saw firsthand God's judgment, and he lived through it himself. So put yourself in Jeremiah's shoes, sandals, at this point in history. Put yourself in his sandals. Think about it. Think about his life and what he went through. He had just been through the siege of Jerusalem. And dear people, the horror of such a siege is just hard to describe. If you want to get some info... Read 2 Kings 6, 24 through 30 with respect to the siege of Samaria by the Syrians. It's unbelievably horrible to be bottled up in a city where you can't get what you need with the defenders all around, the ones attacking. When the city fell, he saw its plundering. That's putting it mildly. And then the fiery destruction of the entire city and the temple. Wow. The walls of the city of the great king were broken down. King Zedekiah, the last king of Judah, was captured, and his sons were put to death in front of him, after which his eyes were put out, and he was bound in bronze chains and deported to Babylon, along with the majority of Judah's citizens. Unbelievable tragedy. So think of the darkness, think of the darkness of this moment for Jeremiah. After a lifetime of ministry with no response, knowing what was coming, faithful to God, having to witness the horror, how terrible for him. The nation had come to an end, the nation. The kingship had come to an end. The people, because of their stubborn, rebellious hearts, had been deported from the land of promise. Can you imagine how his heart was crushed? This is the context in which he writes our text. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. He's thinking about what's just happened. Unbelievable horror. But this I recall to mind. Therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. 
The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Wow, what a response. Kind of highlights the need for us to respond in the midst of our trials and troubles, doesn't it? The way he did. I want you to be like him today. I want you to leave this place and be like Jeremiah as we face the trials and troubles of life. I need it. You need it to be like him. So in the aftermath of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, this happened in 586 B.C., he states three things about God that are significant. As he, it says, recalled these things about God, God's character. It gave him hope in the midst of this dark, dark time, unbelievable suffering, a suffering caused by the nation's sin, which brought God's promised judgment. But let's just pause right here. As he reflects in verse 20, 20 on the horror that he's seen, 21 is where there's a new reflection. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. And here's something that we have to take to heart. See how important it is in the midst of great trials to engage your mind to reflect on the character of God. You have to be able to do that. You can't be overwhelmed by the darkness. You have to engage your mind. And we're going to see how important it is to know the word of God to do that. That just doesn't happen. You have to know God and you have to know his word. Okay? Future hope, he says, therefore I have hope. Future hope is directly related to beholding and believing what you know to be true about your great God and Savior from the Scriptures, not from some foolish ideas that you may have or not from some fantasy land, but from the Bible about who he is. When the storm is raging, Around you, what do you need to do? You need to gaze into the face of the one who loves you and can still the storm with a word. Jeremiah focused on the character of God and had hope in the darkness. Will that be true for us in the midst of darkness? Will we have that kind of hope if we reflect upon our God and our Savior? Yes, you will. You will. So let's think about this reflection a little bit as he recalls, calls these things to mind, to his mind. The Spirit takes the word and impacts your mind and stirs your affections and moves the will to love God in the midst of trials, to persevere in faith. First note, the name Jeremiah uses twice for God in this short text because this name is directly related to the attributes that gave him hope, okay? The word Lord, capitals in English, according to, of course, the Greek or the Hebrew lexicon stands for the Hebrew word Yahweh. This is God's personal covenant name communicated by God to the nation through Moses. We can read that in Exodus 3, 13 following. Then Moses said to God, this is significant, people, defines who he is. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. It's a takeoff from the verb to be. And he said, you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever." 
and this is my memorial name to all generations. So there were three things that he recalled to mind. God's loving kindnesses, his compassions, and his great faithfulness. And they were especially significant when mentioned in conjunction with God's covenant name. Loving kindnesses, and we'll mention it again, is that Hebrew word chesed, loving kindness. And it's plural. It's plural here. Loyal, faithful, covenant-keeping love. It goes with his compassions and his mercies. Remember, that's how he described himself to Moses when Moses said, show me your glory, a God of compassion and mercy, loving kindness and truth is who he is. Marvelous, marvelous. From the beginning, God presents himself as a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. We need to really appreciate this, and we'll talk some more about it. As he comes to Abraham and makes an eternal, unconditional covenant with him, promising to bless him, Israel, and all the nations through him. Through him. And it is important to remember that God's faithfulness to fulfill his promises is directly, directly related to his glory and his fame and his reputation. Right? You make a promise, you keep it. Directly related to who he is. He made it clear to Abraham that he pledged himself, his life, if you will, to faithfully and unconditionally do what he said he would do. Ken preached on this not long ago, but it was about that covenant ceremony he engages in with Abraham. Do you remember the thoughts Ken gave us about that? God reaffirms his promised blessings to Abraham by performing this ceremony. He, he essentially... He's pledging his own life unconditionally to do what he promised Abraham he would do. To fulfill his word to the patriarch. To fail to do what he promised reflects on his very integrity and character. If God reneges on his promises, doesn't that reflect upon God? Does that reflect upon you if you don't do what you say? Sure, how much more with God? When he pledges his life to fulfill what he said. Wow. This is why when God was angry enough to destroy the people of Israel because of their sin against him, you remember following their departure from Egypt and how they acted? What does Moses do? Moses pleads with God on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant and his name being dishonored not to destroy them. Exodus 32, then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? They deserve to be wiped off the earth because of that kind of sin, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Why should the Egyptians, though, speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself, by your own life, and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. Pledged his life. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Why? Because he values his name and his fame and his reputation and he made promises that are unconditional and he will not go back on those promises. Now, dear people, I, where we're going with this, you need to see that this is foundational to your future hope, your future hope, because he's this kind of God. Wow. Wow. Key idea, 
Jeremiah's hope was anchored in the reality that his great covenant-keeping God would be faithful to fulfill his promises for the glory of his name. Dear people, this is our only hope as well, isn't it? It's our only hope. Regardless of the circumstances of your life, we cling to God who is absolutely faithful to his words. Isn't that true? I pray that that's true for you because things can get really dark at times, can't they? And it doesn't seem like there's any help from heaven, but we have his word of promise and you cling to it like Jeremiah does. Think of his circumstances. Couldn't get much darker than it was. And he writes this great text. Amazing. We need to be like Jeremiah. Right? In his relationship with Israel, following the Abrahamic covenant, and based upon it, God enters into three more significant covenants with them. First, there was the Mosaic covenant. We know about that. It was the law, conditional covenant containing both blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience, and was never meant to be in place permanently. It wasn't. came to an end through Christ. But it's God's word. Was he faithful to that covenant? Yep. Then God established the unconditional Davidic covenant, which he promised to David, in which he promised an eternal throne, kingdom, and lineage. Unconditional. I'm going to do it. And finally, through both Jeremiah himself, who's giving us this great text, and Ezekiel, he promised a new covenant, people, that would deal with sins and change the heart, providing gracious hope for an unregenerate, apostate people who had just been deported, who wouldn't listen to him his whole life. You think there's a need for the new covenant? And he prophesied that it would come. Wow. So I think we have in this context where he gives us this great text, we have to have this context in mind. And, and here we have all four great covenants in place as Jeremiah reflects on God's magnificent attributes. It isn't happening in a vacuum. He knows the word. He's reflecting upon truth from the scriptures as he pens these verses for us. The text makes it clear that God's great faithfulness is foundational to Jeremiah's future hope. We know what faithfulness means. Firm, reliable, trustworthy, faithful. In conjunction with his covenant name, the focus is on God being unwaveringly committed to fulfilling his covenant promises that he made. It's directly tied to that plural loving kindnesses, chesed, They go together, loyal, faithful, covenant-keeping love and his compassions. He's a God of faithfulness and truth and loving kindness. Jeremiah, as we have seen, was living in the midst of these, the aftermath of these horrifying circumstances. But what did those circumstances do? They confirmed the Lord's faithfulness to fulfill the promised curses of the Mosaic Covenant. He wasn't playing games with them when he gave him the law. And he warned them and warned them and warned them and said, if you continue to disobey, this is what's coming. He told them early on about the curses he would bring. Is he faithful to do what he says? Yes. Even if it crushes the nation that he had entered into a relationship with at this point in their history. Unbelievable. So, graphic example of God's faithfulness. That's not the kind of thing we like to associate with faithfulness, but that's true for God, isn't it? Don't play games with him. Paul tells us that he is faithful, but if we are faithless, he will not deny himself. He'll bring judgment. You can't just say you know him 
and be faithless. God's not going to let you into heaven. You're going to be judged. He's a faithful God. There's no partiality with him. But here's the, here's the good part. He lived through the faithfulness of God in the judgment. But here, Jeremiah also knew that God's great faithfulness was not just associated with the Mosaic Covenant. His hope was anchored in the same divine faithfulness standing behind the Abrahamic covenant from which the Lord's unconditional covenant love for Israel flowed in spite of their national sin and apostasy. Unbelievable. Jeremiah understood that the nation's violation of the conditional Mosaic covenant did not annul the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. Didn't do it. He knew the truth declared at the end of the pronouncement of the promised Mosaic covenant curses for disobedience, including their removal from the land. This is what God stated in Leviticus 26, 44 and 45. Yet in spite of this, their sin and apostasy. When they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them. Nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them like he did Sodom and Gomorrah wiped them off the face of the earth. Breaking my covenant with them, that's why I won't destroy them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. People, he doesn't change. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11 that this apostate nation right now is beloved for the sake of the fathers. Because God's a God of faithful, covenant-keeping love. Wow. He also was no doubt familiar with the prophet Micah's statement in Micah 7, 18 through 10. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. That's loving kindness, chesed. He delights in that. That's who he is, unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob in unchanging love. Again, chesed to Abraham, which you swore to our forefathers from days of old. This is why Jeremiah declares, as he's reflecting, the Lord's loving kindness is indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's, he's hoping for the future because of the Lord's faithfulness to these unconditional promise he made to Abraham. And I have no doubt Not only was he reflecting upon the Abrahamic promise, but he was also clinging to the hope set forth in both the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. Think about it. Judah's persistent sin, issuing from an uncircumcised, stubborn, rebellious heart, had just caused the the nation to be exiled and the Davidic kingship to come to an end. But the Lord promised unconditionally to David that his line, throne, and kingdom would endure forever. Is he clinging to that? You better believe it. You better believe it. God's going to do what he said, right? Based upon this covenant, Jeremiah had prophesied himself in Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. You can read about this coming one in Isaiah chapter 11 and Daniel chapter 7. Go read those great texts about the one who's coming that he had hope. In future, because it's pretty dark where he's at right now, isn't it? Zedekiah had been, had, is done. Kingship's gone. 
temple land. The Lord also promised through Jeremiah himself a new covenant that would have the divine power to change the stubborn, rebellious hearts of the nation and bring about obedience to God out of love for God. Isn't that marvelous? Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Mosaic covenant, in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You can see it in Ezekiel. He says, I'm going to take out the heart of stone, and I'm going to put in a living heart of flesh so that they'll love me. Wow. Wow, truths we're participating in. And you might also see in Ezekiel that he does this for the sake of his name. For the sake of his name, he does, he promises the new covenant with regard to this people because they profaned his name among the nations. But he's going to vindicate the righteousness and holiness of his name when he brings this covenant. So, recalling to mind, meditating, on these magnificent covenant promises uh, and God's great faithfulness that ensured their future fulfillment for the glory of his name, it caused Jeremiah in the midst of darkness to declare, the Lord is my portion. Man, can you imagine? The Lord's my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. That cry was not in a vacuum. He's clinging to the promises that God had made. Just like we have to just like we have. Dear people, the Lord has not changed, has he? Has the Lord changed at all? No, no. The psalmist declares in Psalm 36, 5, your loving kindness, O Lord, your steadfast, loyal, covenant-keeping love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Praise God that he's this way. Today, if you're a Christian, you're in a covenant relationship with the same God who made these amazing promises in the Old Testament that were the anchor of Jeremiah's hope. You're in a marvelous relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ. You have been grafted into Israel's tree of promise. You have relationship with God through the one who is the fulfillment of all these great promises just spoken about. They're all about him He's the one they focus on. He's the one who fulfills them. Jesus is the one who brings about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant blessing. It was designed by God to be fulfilled by him. You remember Galatians 3.16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he does not say and to seeds as referring to many. Paul wants to drive this home, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. All the blessings promised to Abraham, Israel, and the nations come through this person to, glory, to bring glory to God as he fulfills this great covenant. Right? Paul states in Galatians 3, 8 and 9, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Praise God for that part of the Abrahamic covenant. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Gentiles did not have to become Jews or come under the law to get blessings through this covenant in Christ. Very important. Jesus is the one who fulfills the Davidic covenant. Luke 1, 31 through 33, And behold, you will conceive in your womb Mary and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Paul tells us that we, we believers, are presently citizens of this kingdom, which one day will be gloriously consummated. Not yet, but it's coming, people. It's coming. 
Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We want God to set him on display. Send him back, Lord, to the glory of your great name. Bring the kingdom. He states in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, a text I love. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Where is he? Seated at the right hand of God. Resurrected, ascended, seated at the right hand of God, waiting to come back. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed then you also we will be revealed with him in glory. There's a coming kingdom, and God's going to be exalted through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And praise God, Jesus is the one whose death is the foundation for the fulfillment of new covenant promise, right? Remember what John said when he saw Jesus? Next day, he saw Jesus coming to him. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Sins have to be dealt with. And he's the one who comes to establish the new covenant. Luke twenty two twenty. 20, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's been inaugurated. Praise God. If you're a Christian today, you're participating in the promised new covenant blessings of salvation purchased by the blood of the Lamb. You're in Christ. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit indwells you and is changing you from glory to glory into the image of Christ. You have a new heart that's alive to God and loves Him and obeys Him. The Father Himself, as Ken will get to in 1 Peter, the Father Himself undergirds your faith so that you will enjoy the glorious kingdom inheritance he has promised. Nobody can snatch you out of his hand if you're his. Nobody. People, these great covenant promises were designed by God to glorify first his name through the exaltation of Jesus Christ as the one who fulfills them. Ultimately, it's about him preeminently, not about you. It's about him. And you are now included presently and for all eternity in the blessings promised through these covenants. If you're in Christ by grace through faith in his finished cross work this morning, you are in these promises included. So it's a good place to pause and just talk about the uh, reality of, for each one of us, are, are you in these great promises? Are you in Christ this morning? Is Jesus your lamb this morning? Are you covered by that blood which appeases the infinite wrath of God in your place? Is your faith anchored in his being crushed by the Father in your place, receiving the infinite punishment, wrath that you deserve and he took it? Wow. Uh, if Jesus is not your lamb today, and I just plead with you, I plead with you to embrace him by faith. Won't you come to him? He said, come. And he won't cast you out. You can come by the grace of God to him. He will not turn you away, and you will be brought into these great and magnificent promises that will impact your eternal destiny. Come to Christ. And dear people, there's so many more promises for believers in the New Testament that flow out of these foundational covenant promises we've just talked about. So as we close, let's just reflect upon some. And, and I, I, I want you to, you know, if you're going to recall these things to mind like Jeremiah did, you better know the word of God. You better be storing it up in your heart so that when the trials come, you have it there so you can reflect Recall to mind, and so that it can help you get through them, right? Hebrews 13, 5. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. 
Isn't that great? He's with you if you're his. His thoughts toward you outnumber the sand. He's not far away when the darkness comes, when the storm is raging. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. If you just learn that one today. We know the one, the great promise in Romans 8, 35 through 39, that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? You've, we read it all the time. But let me just make one point about it. Paul says it in verse 38, after he says, we conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other, here's the key, created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Get this. No created thing can thwart the will of the uncreated creator. How could that be? No created thing even begins to measure up to the uncreated creator and his power and ability to keep you and hold you and bring you home. He's the uncreated creator, so no created thing is going to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Impossible. Sometimes we think that that's happening, but it's not. It can't. It can't happen. Paul closes 1 Thessalonians with this, 1 Thess 5, 23, 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved Complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Get this. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Are you going to be changed? Are you going to be brought home? Are you going to be glorified? Yes. Why? Because he's faithful to his word and his promises. God's going to be faithful to sanctify every one of his children and preserve them and bring them home to glory. Isn't that great hope for us? You can't snatch yourself out of his hand. Sometimes we think we might be able to. Such a wretch at times, but no, you can't. You can't. Second Thess 3, 3 through 5. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Wow. The great enemy of God and of the believer he will protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Paul's prayer. The Lord is faithful. He's going to strengthen and protect you from the evil one. That's a promise. That's a promise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will, with the temptation, provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Because God's not about crushing you with temptation. He's about setting himself on display in the midst of it as you love him more than anything else the enemy can offer you and tempt you with. He's the way of escape. His beauty, his majesty, his glory. Get your eyes on him and off of the other stuff. Right? He's faithful. That's a promise, people. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Sometimes this one, man, we have trouble with it, don't we? We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's a promise, an eternal promise. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Is anything going to stop that? No. So that he, why? Why will that happen for you and for all the saints? Here's why. So that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren in the family when it's all said and done. He is going to be set on display and exalted amongst the people of God. And if he's predestined to you, called, 
Those who he called, he justified, and justified, he, he will glorify, right? It's a done deal. A couple more. How are we doing? Good. 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being re- renewed day by day. Promise. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Far beyond all comparison. People, when it's really dark, is that promise still in place? Yes, it's in place. Philippians 3, I like this. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait, eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory. By the exertion of the power he has even to subject all things to himself, you have the hope of resurrection forever to be in his presence. Wow. Will will that put a dent in the darkness for you? It better. It better. This is not our home. Ken says that a lot. Don't put your roots down here. That's silly. You have a great hope. So, for the glory of his great name, God's great faithfulness stands behind the fulfillment of what he has promised you in his beloved son. All anchored in the great promises we've just talked about that were true for Jeremiah. In the midst of the various trials and troubles and the storms of life, his great promises, and get this, his great promises behind which stand the full weight of his omnipotent power to bring them about, should fan the flames of hope for both your present walk and your future glory. Can I make it through the storm? Yes. Can I endure through the darkness? Yes. Because he's faithful. He is faithful. And he's with you. Let me encourage you just by way of implication to memorize many of these great texts. How can you recall them to mind if you don't know them? Jeremiah knew the word, and he recalled it to mind. Please do that. As well as the great text, for me, this helps me, not only the promises, but the great text that highlight the beauty of Christ and his person and work, such as Colossians 1, 13 through 20. Memorize that. Chew on it. When you have an opportunity throughout the day, memorize it, get it, recall it to mind. The beauty, the infinite beauty, majesty, and glory of the person of Jesus Christ. Image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. All things created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Put that in your heart. It will help you. I guarantee it. It will help you. God's name, reputation, and glory are at stake in the fulfillment of his promises, which is why his great faithfulness assures us that not one word of any of those promises is ever going to fail. Not one word. Not one. And be encouraged that everything will be to the praise of the glory of his name through the exaltation of his beloved son. That's what God's all about. The lion and the lamb who forever guarantees the eternal fulfillment of every one of these promises. Every one. In whose face we will see the radiance of the glory of God forever. If you're a believer this morning, you've been brought into these marvelous promises through faith in Christ. And I'm telling you, in the midst of the darkest trial, you can say with Jeremiah, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. 
They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jeremiah. Dear saint, godly man, who in the midst of the darkest time in the history of the nation of which he was a part, could say when it was all, when everything appeared to be hopeless and done and unbelievably crushed, oh, I'm going to cling to God's promises because his loyal, faithful, love, covenant-keeping love will never fail because he's faithful. Oh, God, cause the saints here to cling to your promises today. There are people here who are hurting. There are life and death issues on the table, financial problems, medical problems, all kinds of things that, that the, the enemy uses to kind of cloud us in and make things dark. But, oh, God, we have your promises. Help us to recall them to mind. And may our hearts be turned around to bring honor to you by trusting in you, even though we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel sometimes. Please do your work in our hearts. For those who don't know you, Lord, oh, may you cause them to want to be brought in to all that can be theirs in Jesus Christ. Through his shed blood, may they run into his arms by faith today. Thank you for this time of meditation, dear God. Thank you for your wonderful word. It's in your name we pray, to the glory of your great name. Amen.